Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining me once again today. I do really appreciate having your company. We've just got over a, a holiday season and uh, there's another one coming. <laughs> they seem to come very quickly, don't they? Anyway, a, a dear friend of mine um, was having a, a get-together with the family and um, one of the rules uh, for this family is that you know you don't uh, get together and talk around the dinner table or get together and talk about religion or politics and uh, I, sort of, I find that quite funny. Um, politics, yeah absolutely, <laughs> man-made problems but to talk about God, well hey you know the biggest problem I guess when it comes to that kind of conversation around the, the dinner table is that you know everybody's got a, a different idea non-biblical idea most of the time um, about who God is and what God wants and how they should worship him or if he exists or he doesn't exist there's all these kind of different things that go on and people uh, you know just try to avoid it and uh, quite often you'll find you know somebody who's very outspoken at the table um, will just say well look just make up your own mind just you know think whatever you want to think believe whatever you want to believe so I thought I'd address that today because um, that's a, a topic that is mentioned in the Bible um, where people just want to ignore uh, the, the Bible or any, anything to do with the Bible um, and uh, you know just put all religions in, into the one basket and go make up your own mind. Well sure, you do have to make up your own mind but I want to give you some information about that might help you make up your own mind and that's, you know... The God of creation, who created you, who created me, who created everything that we see, who lives outside of time, space and matter, that God, okay, created us in his image, okay, because he loved us. Now, he's not going to leave you without any guidance, without any word, without any way to reconcile unto him. He's not going to leave you destitute, hopeless, to make up your own mind. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God of creation. That is not the God who created you, me, and everything in this world today. That is not the God we serve. That is not the God of the Bible. That, you know, people just make up in their own mind some kind of God and how I should get to him. Maybe I'll be good enough one day. Maybe I won't. Uh, maybe there's a heaven. Maybe there's a hell. Maybe there's not. I'll be agnostic. I'll be atheistic. I'll just wait and see. I'll be on the fence. I'll follow all faiths. I'll do, I'll do whatever I feel like doing. And that's what the person at the table is basically telling you. They're telling you, go away and get confused. That's another way of saying, go away and get confused. That is not a leader. That is not a person who understands anything because if you do understand something, you would know full well that God, okay, the creator of the universe, the creator of everything, time, space and matter, has given us a guidance, a map, a road map, a GPS. He's not left us destitute. He's not left us to make up our own minds and our own imaginations. God is not like that. That's not the God that I serve. Maybe you serve a God that has completely confused you. Maybe you serve a God that says there's nothing and no way you can ever know. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's a God you've made up in your own mind. That is not the God of this creation. That is not the God of love, mercy and grace. That's not the God who sent his son so that we can be reconciled unto him. Heaven is a place where there is no sin. Could you imagine if heaven let sin and it'd be messed up like earth? No, it's separated for that very reason. Because it's not messed up. It is pure, it is perfect, it is lovely. There is no pain, there is no suffering. The other place is different, isn't it? The Bible describes it as, 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 as a hellfire, as a torment, as something horrible. That's what it describes it as. Because it's the opposite of heaven. Think of good, think of evil. You know, Think of good things, think of bad things. Think of peace, think of war. I mean... All those things are obvious to me. There, 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 are, there has to be a balance. There has to be an equilibrium. There has to be something. Like, and God gave that balance. And God gave a balance to mankind that we don't walk around going, oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to think. No, God is not that sort of a God. He's given us this book. I love this book. This is my King James Bible, which is the best translation, I believe, in the English language. 
And I love it because it's a roadmap, it's a path. It's telling us how to get to heaven. It's telling us what to avoid with sin. It's telling, oh, there's that word. It's telling us what, how, how to have a better life, how to have more peace. If more politicians listen to this, then there wouldn't be as many problems. And maybe people would sit around the dinner table and talk about politics. But when, you know, half the politicians in the world can't make up their mind uh, about gender, half the politicians can't make up the, their mind whether there's a global warming or global cooling, half the politicians in the world can't make up their mind uh, uh, what de democracy is. Or, or Look, it goes on and on. So why would you trust mankind when he's got his mind so mixed up with just the basics of life? The very, very basics of life, mankind has messed up. But God hasn't done that. He's given us the book. He's given us the guidance. He's given us the word. He's given us the way. He's given us the truth. He's given us the life. He's given us Christ. He's given us everything that we could possibly need. So when somebody sits there and goes, make up your own mind, what they're saying to you is go away and be confused. That's not very good. That's a very, very poor leadership. Okay? I'm sorry, but it is. No apologies for anything because really, if you're a good leader and you're a strong leader and you've thought about it, <clears throat> you would realise that God would never do such a thing. God would never leave his people without guidance. God would never lead his people uh, with no hope. That is not the God we serve. In the old times, it was through the prophets, through the law, by keeping the sacrifices. In the New Testament, it's through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other name given under heaven by when, which men must be saved, not should be saved, not can be saved, must be saved. There's no other name. That's the God we serve because he's done all those things. And there's a way for you to know you do not have to walk around going, I'm not sure I don't know. The Bible says it. It's not Martin Reed. It's what this beautiful book, the Divine Library, says. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this so clear word of God that gives us the instructions from the beginning of creation to the end of Revelation, to the second coming of Christ, to the rapture. Father, it gives us everything that we need to know. For some, it seems to be hard to understand, but we must start with just believing and beginning Father, I pray today as we open this beautiful book that people's eyes and hearts and spiritual awareness would be opened, Father, and they would no longer say, make up your own mind, but they would say, listen to what the Creator, the Lord, has to say through his wonderful word. We thank you in the precious name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. Now, Jesus had much teaching on this business of make up your own mind, make up your own laws, make up your own ways. He spent a lot of time teaching the multitudes and teaching the disciples that that was not the right way. You couldn't just say, I'm going to make up my own mind and do it my own way. Christ came to give us and show us a better way. So let's turn to uh, the book of Luke and turn with me to chapter 12. And we'll start reading there what it says. It says this, in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all. So there was a lot, a lot of people gathered in a small area here. And, you know, anyone who's ever been to, you know, I guess a concert or something would know you're all squashed in together. You've got to avoid people's feet and legs and all kinds of things. I'm not a fan of that sort of thing. I prefer a concert where I can just sit and enjoy. But anyway, um, now, words in red of Christ. You've got the circumstances where he is talking to the, the disciples, first of all, so that they can actually have an understanding of what he's teaching. Words in red, it says, Beware ye of the leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So what he's saying is that the, the Pharisees here, um, they speak hypocrisy, okay? Because the Pharisees often made up their own way. Maybe someone had said to them at the dinner table, make up your own mind. Mm, yeah, okay. Um, verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Jesus said there's nothing hid. God hasn't hidden this word to people. You can go out and buy this book. You can go out and get a Bible in this country. In some countries it's a lot harder. Yeah, but you can go and get one. You don't, you, you don't have to, to, you know, fear persecution or, or, or feel even death. 
You don't have to. You can get this book. Nothing's in. God didn't hide the way to get to heaven. No, he didn't. I'll read it again. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Love it. Words in red. Verse 3. Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. So just remember when you sit at the dinner table and you say, I'll make up my own mind, God's listening. And that's not what he asked you to do. It's not what he asked you to do. It's not what he asked me to do. I once upon a time was in that place. Make it up my own mind. Yep, okay. And that which you have spoken in the ear, in the closets, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. God knows everything that you've done and you've said and you probably can't understand that. It's outside of our comprehension. It's outside of my comprehension that he could know so much and be so much. But when I look at the universe and I look at time, space and matter and he is outside of those things, he is beyond those things, he created those things. I can't understand that, no. It, it's beyond the comprehension of men. But the book here is not beyond the comprehension of men, no. God says, I'll listen, I'll hear, I'll know. Don't hide things. Don't, don't tell people false things. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be with hypocrisy. Don't tell somebody make up their own mind. No, that's not what God wanted. God didn't want you to make up your own mind. He wants you to make up your own mind, yes, about coming to him or not coming to him. But when it comes to how to get to him, that's just not, that's not negotiable. God says, come to me through Christ. In the Old Testament, come to me through sacrifices. In the New Testament, come to me through Christ. There's no other way. It's not hidden. Let's read on with some more verses. Um, still in the book of Luke, turn back a couple of pages to Luke uh, chapter 8, verse 17. It says, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Again, God says, it'll all, be, it'll all come out. Can't just make up our own minds. Let's go back to the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes um, chapter 12, verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. <laughs> there it is. Um, and I'm, I'm scooting around a bit today, but there's so much I want to uh, get to. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked, open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. Of him whom we have to do. The Bible's very, very, very clear. Um, I think that maybe uh, the people who don't believe the Bible, who don't believe in God, whether they're agnostic, atheistic, whether they're uh, a different faith or whatever, don't understand the completeness of the book. The completeness of the book is this. It, it tells about... The, the whole of uh, creation, okay, before God spoke it into existence. It talks all of the way through the Bible to the end of creation as we know it into a new creation that God has planned for those who love him. It is complete, okay? It is a totally complete book. It is the first book ever written, the first book ever printed, the first book ever prophesied. And all the other books... Uh, just just do not compare because they don't have all that information. They don't, and, and look, hey, <laughs> there have been some in the past who tried to make up how it began and how it ends, and they've all come tumbling down. There have been all these different um, cults and things, and the world's coming to an end, and this is happening, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that you won't know, and people make all these things up, like Jesus said, as we read earlier on in Luke. He said, you know, don't be like the Pharisees, don't be hypocrites, don't, don't you know, believe in yourself. And, you know, when, when we sit down and we tell other people, oh, don't, you know, don't do this or don't do that, you know, we, we ourselves become like those Pharisees. Now, I don't say to people, don't do this or don't do that, because, you know, that, that makes me the judge and I'm not your judge. All I'm saying is that there's a, there's a better way, there's a truthful way, okay, and there is a judge who's not like man's judge, who says, make up your own mind about what's right and wrong. This is a, a judge, the Lord, who says, you're all equal. I love you all the same. 
I want you all to be back in my presence all the same. I created you the same. I created you in my image. I created you for my glory. I created you for the majesty because I created you in my image. You think that God is going to leave you with no pathway to get there? Do you think the God who created you in his image is just going to leave you to make up your own mind? As I said earlier, look what happens when men make up their own minds about what's right and wrong. What happens? We get wars, we get crime, we get evil things, we get persecution, we get non-democratic countries. We get all that stuff that you see in the world today. All the hurt and all the suffering. Because people go, make up your own mind. Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. You want to be part of all that? I left all that behind over 30 years ago. I don't want to be part of making up my own mind. God has made up my mind for me. And that's a greater mind. You know, God says his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Of course they're not. All we understand is time, space and matter. We don't understand anything else. It's human minds. Even the best physicists in the world struggle to understand physics. Atoms. <laughs> how they work. How cells work inside of cells and millions of them all doing different things. You'll never find out. No. Because even, even if you had the most powerful microscope in the world and you got inside the millionth of a cell inside a cell, there's another million inside of that. And there's another trillion inside of that. You know, it's like, it's like I've said before about the flower seed. I've got, you know, a, 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 a seed from one flower in my hand. But that, that, that could be a million flowers in there. Because God has programmed it that way. Can you understand it? No. I often speak to young people and, and, I, and I did this very thing. I had a seed and I said to them, listen, how, how many flowers are in my hand? And they said, oh, sir, that's one flower. I said, is it? Really? Think again, but when this one flower comes, it'll have more seeds. And when those seeds come, they'll have more seeds. And more seeds, and more seeds. It's the same principle we use for witnessing. We say, you know, if, if you talk to people and somebody can be saved, they save more people who save more people who save more people. That's the way it works. Sometimes you don't see it. Um, you, you don't know what's going on, but God knows what's going on. That's why his word never returns void. The Bible tells us the word of God is not void it never returns unfruitful. If you start making up your own things, that will be unfruitful. Let's read on with a few more verses. Uh, turn over with me now to the book of uh, Psalms. You know how much I love the Psalms. Psalm 44 verse 21 says, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Of course he does. God knows what's in the heart. And then let's turn over quickly to Proverbs uh, chapter 25 verse 9. It says, Debate thy cause with thy neighbour himself, and discover not a secret to another. <laughs> now, maybe I should read that slowly again. Debate the cause with thy neighbour himself, and discover not a secret to another. And discover not a secret to another. You know, you can be misled um, by your neighbour. You can be misled by a friend. You can be misled by somebody in your family to start believing something other than what's in the Bible. It happens. That's why we have so many faiths in the world today. But the test, the test of the faiths is very simple. And it's this. We don't have a, a tomb that we go to to serve a religious leader who's dead. We don't have that. We have a living saviour who has risen from the dead, defeated death, defeated sin, and is at the right hand of the throne of God, a living saviour. We're not waiting for some uh, old religious leader to, to rise out of the grave. We're not waiting for that. We're not waiting for something to happen that you know we made up in our mind. We're not, we're not waiting for that. The saviour's already finished it, the work was done at Calvary, and he's risen. It's, it's, it's complete. And it was given to you, it was given to me as a way to be reconciled unto God. Because God wanted a way. But it wasn't our way. Because if you speak to people, they go, look, I'm just going to be a very good person. I'm going to give to charity. I'll go to church every now and then. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice to people. I'll be good to my friends. I'll be good to my neighbours. And God will look at me and go, you're good enough. But really? How good is it? You have to be. Because... Joe across the road's not bad either, and you know, 
Delma down the road's not bad either, and Bob across the road's not bad either, and, and James across the road and, and, and Sarah across the road are not bad either. So how, what's good and what's bad? It becomes subjective. And God's not in the business of subjectiveness. He's in the business of all are equal. You'll all be judged the same. But does God say that your works will get you to heaven? No. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Making up your own mind about works. Chapter 2, starting in verse 8. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. Nothing else, okay? And, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. God gave his son as a gift. That's why we give gifts at Christmas to uh, recognize the greatest gift that was ever given to us, Jesus Christ. Verse 9. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, because, as I said to you before, there are all those people around who go, oh, my works are good, I've, I've done pretty good, I, I'm not a bad person, I, I'm, I'm good, look at me, I'm, I'm a good citizen, I'm a role model citizen, I'm, I'm morally okay. There are morally okay people out there, of course there are. There are people who, good, who do good things, but God says, no, no, that's not what my judgment is. That might be your judgment. And you might look at Bob down the road and go, oh, no, I don't think his works are good enough. Oh, and Sarah over there, no, I don't think her works are good enough. You know, she spoke about so and so and so. No, that's not the way God works. God says, no, 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 no. You come to me through Christ and it's all forgiven. I don't deal in the way that men deal. I don't deal in men's speech. I don't deal in making up your own mind. No, I don't. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. God created you. He didn't leave you destitute, hopeless, without a way. No, no. And it says here, you're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Okay, you're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Come to Christ, do works. But the works get you to heaven? No, it's about coming to Christ. Sure, God wants you to do good things. Sure, God wants you to be a morally good person. Sure, God wants you to help charities. Sure, God wants you to help your neighbour. Sure, God wants you to do things. But he also wants you to tell the truth. <laughs> And the truth is, you've got to tell people God didn't leave you without a way. Don't make up your own mind. Read it again. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has told you, God has told me the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. He's told us the way. He didn't leave you in a space where you didn't know what to do. He didn't leave you in a space where men says, make it up yourself. He didn't leave you like the Pharisees where you could just make up rules on the spot and do whatever you wanted to do, like they did to Christ when Christ was on the earth. Holy man, holy God. They just kept changing the rules. And today, we live in a world where they just keep changing the rules. They change everything. They change history. They change science. They change education. They change everything and say, make up your own mind. Well, the greatest thing that you could do is make up your mind to follow what God has given us. Not what man has given you, because that will fail. Just look at the world around you and see what man makes up in his mind, and it doesn't work. If it did, there wouldn't be any wars. There would be peace. There would be harmony. There would be love. There would be mercy. There's grace. But none of those things exist under men. They only exist under the precious leadership of God. And how do you find that out? Through his holy word, the Bible. There is no other way that you will ever, ever have an understanding of God without reading his word. There is no way that you'll ever have salvation other than through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Those are such beautiful words. Today I pray that you would accept Christ as your Saviour and begin reading this wonderful book that is the way, that is the truth, that is the life. And stop making up your own mind and your own way, because that won't work. Many have tried it before. Many have failed, sadly, but you don't have to be one of them. Today you can come to Christ through true repentance and ask for forgiveness of sins and start living a more heavenly life here on earth. What a wonderful thing that is. Lord bless. Bye for now. 
death. It can strike without a moment's notice. A young person, full of life in the morning, can be gone forever by the end of the workday. A father takes his last breath as his heart gives way unexpectedly. A mother dies during a routine operation. A sister with cancer. A brother in a car wreck. A fall. Old age. War. Death is a relentless foe. It hunts us until it has each one of us in its grasp. Our cemeteries testify to the fact that our battle with death is a losing one. Death always wins. Death is coming for you. Are you ready to go wherever death takes you? Some believe that nothing happens after we die. We just cease to exist. Others believe that there is a heaven and that all but the really bad go there. Still others believe that there is a God who will judge man according to his works and allow the good into heaven and send the bad to hell. Are any of these views correct? How can we know? Where can we turn for answers? Nearly a third of all the people living on earth today say they are Christians. That means that they take the Bible as their holy book and consider its writings sacred. But even many Christians are not fully aware of what the Bible teaches on this most important subject, death. Why should we consider the Bible's point of view? There are a few things that commend the Bible. First, virtually every prophecy written in the Bible has already been fulfilled. This is in stark contrast with other religious writings which contain no fulfilled prophecy. The Bible tells of events that would befall Israel as a nation. It tells us that in the last days, every man would be numbered before being allowed to buy or sell. Far-fetched? Not anymore. For what other reason should we consider the Bible's point of view? The Bible has its roots all the way back to the earliest recorded history of man. It takes its place with the earliest recorded writings, and this book has given comfort to billions in every age. This book has life-transforming power. People have died for the words and the message in this book. Finally, and most importantly, we believe this book when it claims to be the very words of God. So what does the Bible have to say about death? Does it have any answers about this dark and mysterious subject which casts a pall over all men? Yes, one of the major themes of Scripture is the subject of death. We find death in the first chapters of Genesis and in the final chapters of Revelation. The Bible has good news and bad news about death. Let's consider the bad news first. The Bible says that death is not natural. God did not intend for man to die. Death is a curse on man for his rebellion against God. God gave man the world in a perfect state, but man rebelled against God. If we take the Ten Commandments as a basic outline for God's standard of righteousness, we quickly find that each of us is guilty of breaking some or most of these commandments. Prohibitions on stealing and killing are in there, but so is lying, dishonoring our parents, making idols, adultery, and failing to worship the only true God. Many people believe that there are big sins and small sins, and that as long as you haven't killed anyone, you'll probably go to heaven. Unfortunately, that is not what the Bible teaches. Ezekiel 18.20 The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. The bad news about death is that it is a result of sin. But it gets worse. Man dies physically because of sin. But there is a coming judgment because of sin, in which man will be sentenced to spiritual death in a place the Bible calls the lake of fire. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, 
shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you believe that? The death that we see all around us in this wicked world is not the end, but it certainly testifies to the fact that God must mean what He says. God has promised eternal torment for sinners. Based on what we've seen so far, do you believe that you are a sinner? Instead of giving yourself the benefit of the doubt, why don't you truly scrutinize yourself and ask yourself if you could be in danger of God's coming judgment? Only when you stand in doubt of yourself and seek to find a remedy to your sinful condition will this next part make any sense to you. And that is the subject of this video. The meaning of the term gospel. The Greek word gospel means good news. And having considered the sobering subject of death, we need some good news. The good news is that God loves man. He loves men, women, and children so much that He Himself took the penalty of your sin and mine. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. You and I are sinners, but Jesus never sinned. Even His enemies could find no fault with Him. Because He was perfect, His death was undeserved. It was a substitutionary sacrifice. He died in your place. He died the death that we should have died. Men naturally believe in substitutionary sacrifices. In the most uncivilized places, we find man offering the blood of animals to appease their gods. They believe that something or someone else can die in their stead. But the news gets better. Jesus died, was put in a grave for three days, and rose again. After His resurrection, He was seen by multitudes of people who testified to the fact that He was alive after death. The Apostle Paul testified to that fact this way, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Do you believe that? Friend, let me ask you something. Are you tired of your sin? Have you ever wanted to be clean from the evil things you've done? Does death and what lies beyond frighten you? You can have peace with God today because Jesus Christ died in your place. That is the meaning of the term gospel. The good news is that Jesus Christ offers pardon to sinners he can blot out every transgression and desires to do so. He can give you a new start on life. Throw yourself on God's mercy. Openly confess your sin to God. Plead His forgiveness on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you. John 6.28 Then they said unto Him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent.